Tiki Hut Media. Pop the top on your favorite beer or whatever you drink from Tiki Hut Media. This is Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. Grace, peace, and cheers to you as we pop open a beer today on Soul Ramblings Podcast and talk about faith and life. Hi, everybody. I'm Jerry. So glad you could join us today. And today we're talking about how the truth makes us odd. The the writer Flannery O'Connor reportedly once said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you odd. Now, she was playing with the scripture verse where Jesus says, You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, to be sure, there is freedom in knowing the truth, the truth of the gospel. But to really know that truth, to really live into it, will also make us odd. In the middle of a chaotic and violent world, a world full of malevolent authorities and powers, we are called to be odd. And in our very oddness, That's where our freedom lies. This call to oddness shows in the instructions in Matthew's gospel, uh, the ninth chapter, starting with the 35th verse in the Common English Bible. It says, Jesus traveled among all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, announcing the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were troubled and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The size of the harvest is bigger than you can imagine, but there are few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers for his harvest. Notice that word in verse 36 there. It says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. And that compassion, I think, is what makes us odd, but yet it's what makes us free. A while back, I was reading a story, and I can't remember where I saw this, but it was about a young couple who moved to Los Angeles, California, and they were looking for fame and fortune and quickly found themselves homeless and destitute. It was a very moving story. In any event, when describing how the couple was able to to survive during their darkest days, the article said, in sort of an offhand way, they were able to eat, get clothing, and perform other necessities through the help of churches, through the help of Christians. And it would have been easy to miss that little nugget when reading that article, but there it was, just a brief mention of it, one sentence and an otherwise long story about a couple lost and scared, harassed and helpless, but a mention nonetheless about how they were able to survive an otherwise insurmountable situation. They survived because of the compassion of Christian people who make up the church. And if there's anything that should define us, us as Christians, us as believers, it is love, grace, and compassion that's put into action. And that, of course, is because we have a Savior, Jesus Christ, who is filled with love, grace, and compassion. And he lived his life on earth, putting it into action. And we see that in this scripture reference from Matthew 9. All through the towns and villages, he was going through all of these towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Now, we're told when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I believe this is one of my favorite passages because it shows the heart of God. Jesus saw people, saw human beings just like you and me. He saw their overwhelming need and he had compassion on them. And this compassion is a concern for the suffering of others, and it is part of what makes us odd and makes us free. But it goes even beyond that. It means this word compassion means to suffer with. It means that someone else's heartbreak becomes our heartbreak. Somebody else's suffering becomes our suffering. 
And true compassion changes the way we live. It motivates us to try and relieve the suffering of those for whom we have compassion. It's the ability to empathize with the emotional state of another person without necessarily feeling the same way. It's also good for us. It sets us free. According to Dr. James Dotty, professor of neurology at Stanford University, he says practicing compassion has a positive physiological effect on our bodies. It can lower blood pressure, boost our immune system, and lessen our anxiety. Brain imaging shows that being compassionate stimulates the same pleasure centers associated with our drive for food, water, and other necessities of life. In a study by Elizabeth Dunn at the University of British Columbia, participants were given a certain amount of money. Half of the participants were told to spend the money on themselves. The other half were told to spend the money on others. At the end of the study, the participants who had spent the money on others felt significantly happier than those who had spent the money on themselves. Other studies show that practicing compassion can help fight disease and increase our lifespan. One reason why compassion helps to boost our well-being is that it helps broaden our perspective beyond ourselves. Research shows that depression and anxiety are linked to being focused on self, preoccupied with me, myself, and I. But when we do something for somebody else, that state of self-focus shifts to a state of other focus. As our attention shifts to helping another person, suddenly our mood lifts. Rather than feeling blue, we may feel energized to help, and before we know it, we may even have gained some perspective about our own situation, too. I think that practicing compassion is essential for our survival. I also believe it is what God has created us to do. It's how God created us to live. And we are created in God's image, right? The Bible tells us that Jesus' teaching, preaching, and healing are all motivated by his compassion. We are told that When Jesus saw the crowds of people, he had compassion on them. And this isn't just some sort of feeling or sentimental feeling or emotional feeling. Jesus' compassion comes from the seat of his emotions and prompts him to act. And so deep is Jesus' compassion and concern for people that he has come into the world to shepherd us, to love us, and ultimately to die to save us. In this passage in Matthew, it says that Jesus had compassion on the people because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. It's dangerous to leave sheep by themselves with no shepherd. They are helpless and harassed by predators. They also wander around aimlessly, not knowing where they're headed or where they might find food. And they are powerless to change their situation. In the original language, harassed means mangled with skin ripped off, and helpless means throw down. In other words, Jesus' heart is so broken because he sees the people as sheep who are in the process of being destroyed by the wolves in their lives. Think about the people in your community who are in the process of being destroyed by the wolves in their lives, addictions, abandonment, feelings of hopelessness and isolation. It may be those who are jobless or underemployed or in a financial crisis or in financial distress. It may be people who are in destructive relationships and they see no way out. It may be the rich. It may be the poor. It may be folks who have been turned off by churches that judge them and give them the impression that they are not wanted, not good enough, not moral enough, not enough like them to be a part of God's kingdom. It may be a myriad of young people who don't even know what churches are because we have gotten a few generations down the road from the days when the majority of people went to church anyway. We, we Christians, exist to care for all people and reach out to them with compassion and love. Notice in verse 37 here in Matthew 9, Jesus kind of shifts. He's got some sort of urgency happening here, and he changes the imagery. He says the crowds are suddenly fields ripe for harvest. Laborers are needed immediately to reap this bumper crop. And then a question here, 
who is available. He, he's essentially saying who is available to become one of God's workers in God's harvest field. You know, we only need to believe that Jesus embodies God's love and follow his lead in order to be a part of the solution to the problems of this world. God's workers see the crowds the way God sees them and responds with compassion the way Jesus does. Professor Tom Long points out that these are words Jesus is always speaking to the church and to us as Christians. This is a mission that cannot wait for a more opportune time when the church is stronger or richer or more confident or more influential. The harvest time has come and laborers are needed in the fields today. The sheep are out there being mauled. They need help immediately. Jesus says to his first disciples, and he says to us, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. As we pray for workers, we find that we are the answer to our own prayers. And you know, it's pretty awesome. Jesus gives us a job that we can't live without. Jesus calls us to practice compassion, to be odd. And compassion is what everyone needs, both those receiving it and those giving it. And so, you and me, we are those who are sent out. We are sent out to be the proclamation that the kingdom of God is near both in word and deed. It's been said that most people need to see the gospel before they believe the gospel. And you and me, we are probably going to be the only gospel some people ever see. Jesus' desire is for us to play a major role. And so we come together, we worship, we get spiritually fed, we fellowship with one another. But our worship is also in how we live our faith throughout the week. It's the compassion we show to others at work, at school. It's also the excellence with which we perform our work since God calls us to excellence. And it's also what we do in our retirement, our service, how we spend our precious time. It's how we interact with those in need, or rather, whether we interact with those in need at all. It's also getting to know, love, and reach out to our neighbors. It's a strange phenomenon, but so many of us don't know and don't interact much with our neighbors anymore. What if we were to get to know the people who live next door or down the street? What if we were to reach out to them in love? I don't know, maybe offer to mow their grass when they go out of town, invite them over for dinner for no reason at all, or just show them love. You know, if you drive through a lot of neighborhoods, I know I've seen this before, you see a bunch of houses with no one outside. It's like we live in silos cut off from our neighbors and the outside world. What can we do to get to know one another? Well, there are many ideas and many suggestions. I'm sure you've got some as well. And the world is starving to know that God is real and the, that Jesus is love incarnate. And he can and does transform people, changing them from agents of selfishness to agents of love. And if they want to, they can experience the same transformation. They can live with Christ in their hearts as well. That's what following Christ is all about. It's not about becoming obsessed with partisan politics. It's not trying to force people to see things our way. It's not about judgment. It's not about who's allowed in and who's not. It's about experiencing and having the compassion of Christ for those around us, meeting people where they are and accepting and loving them how they are. And by doing this, by being engaged in this kind of living, maybe without even realizing it, we are being workers in God's harvest field. So may it be so with us. May this be how we live out our days. And may this be how we treat others and show the love of Christ to our neighbors. May they see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. This is what our world needs more than anything else. People living with the compassion of Christ in their hearts and living out this compassion in their everyday lives. Odd indeed. I mean, no matter what the bullies of the world will try to tell us, whether they occupy the highest positions of power in the nations or the boardrooms of corporations or just the local people in our schools and neighborhoods, we will always choose compassion. 
We will choose hope and we will choose forgiveness. We will choose life because we are odd. And in our world today, this will make us odd, but it will also make us free. We can stand firm in the Lord and in the strength of his power because we know that the, as Paul talked about, the principalities and powers of the old age have been defeated. When the bullies of this world confront us, we will speak truth and tell them that their days are numbered. We will practice a higher righteousness that will not return evil for evil and will proclaim to them the gospel of peace, making known to them God's offer of forgiveness and reconciliation. Try as they may, the bullies of the world will not be able to defeat us because, as Paul says in Romans, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Being compassionate and knowing that truth will make us odd, but it will also make us free. Glory to God. Amen. Be sure to get social with us on Soul Ramblings Podcast by going to our Facebook and Instagram page. You can like us and follow us there and interact with us. Uh, we'd love to get to know you over on social media. You can also check us out on Substack. We have a Substack page that not only features new episodes of the podcast each and every week, but we also have our Sunday Ramblings weekly devotional on Sunday morning, straight to your inbox. You can sign up for free and follow us there. You can also support us financially if you're so inclined for $5 a month or $50 for an annual subscription, but that is not necessary. If you can't do that, not a problem, no judgment, go ahead and sign up for free. I want to thank you for the gift and privilege of your time today. I know your time is valuable and I appreciate you spending time with us here at Soul Ramblings Podcast. And as we wrap up today from Philippians 4, 8, from now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things, all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Look forward to seeing you back here next time on Soul Ramblings Podcast. Thank you for being here. I'm Jerry Wicker. Grace, peace, cheers. Thanks for listening to Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. Download new episodes every week. And if you haven't already, subscribe and be sure to leave us a rating and review. Soul Ramblings is a Tiki Hut Media production. Yeah.